Hey guys, Jay from Ecotech. As you may or may not know, we've been doing a lot of work over the last few years with Dr. Craggs, Jamie Craggs, from the Horniman Institute in London. He's been doing a lot of groundbreaking work using our equipment and procedures that he's developing himself on how to spawn coral in captivity. Obviously, he's working in a laboratory environment and determining how to isolate some of these variables as well as what the specific cues and criteria are for best success in spawning coral. As his work continues though, and he unlocks some of these secrets, it becomes easier for others, particularly those of us in the reef aquarium hobby, to replicate the same thing. However, in the meantime, people have seen spawning events in their own tanks. And this has actually happened up at our friends Pat and Trina's place at Reef Wholesale up in Toronto, Canada. So I'm actually gonna give her a call to get her take on how she raised some coral babies from a spawning event that happened in one of their commercial systems all the way through to frags and eventually colonies, which they are going to include in their aquaculture program for commercial resale. So let's get her on the phone. Hello, Trina. Hey, Jay. How are you? I'm doing not too bad. I can't complain. And you? Good. One of my favorite conversational topics with you is the coral babies. Can you uh, tell a story? I know you've probably told it a couple times now, but uh, we're going to go, we're going to kind of hear what I think we want to hear is the challenges associated with having a spawning event and then actually growing out those babies, not being in a uh, research facility, but actually being in a commercial system. So how did that all happen and go for you? Okay, so anybody who's heard some of our stories about the coral spawnings that we had here, they know that it was completely by accident. So we are running our commercial systems like we always do, low nutrient, uh, making sure we have the parameters spot on. And we ended up coming in one day and noticing that some corals had settled onto the glass, uh, the racks, and consequently, again, some of the bases of our corals. So this kind of shifted our focus here, and we ended up collecting all the babies, uh, gluing them down. How did you collect them? Uh, so what we ended up doing was I had to clean off the glass. That's actually where we noticed the majority of the babies. I would say probably 75% of them were on the glass, and I noticed them because I was just scraping off the coralline algae one day, trying to keep our tanks nice and clean and I noticed that there was something just a little bit different. I couldn't make out exactly what it was uh, but once I did that I cleaned off around them. We gave them a couple weeks to settle because initially they were smaller than an eighth of an inch. So we cleaned up around them and then we let them grow a little bit larger and I used the corner of a razor blade to just get in under the edge and be able to pop them off the glass. Or some of them had settled into the corners of the egg crate because we use that to keep all of our corals up in the air to have a detritus free system. And those ones where they settled in the corner, it was a little bit more tricky to get them out. The razor blade would not work. So I cleaned up to the very edge of the coral and then what I used was a dental pick to actually just kind of pop them off. And then we took them from that point. We, I collected them all in just a little shoe bin and then proceeded on the painstaking task of gluing each individual one onto a coral frag just with a normal uh, Ecotech glue. Uh, just we had to use a very, very tiny amount uh, to stick them down. Oh, wow. Okay. So you, you have them now on their individual coral uh, frag plugs. Yes. And, uh, and then one of the big challenges obviously is that, that, uh, embryonic coral competes with algae, right? I mean that both coralline and, uh, and green algae, right? Did you, did you see that happen at all? Yes, we did. So luckily again, um, we had known some of the information from Jamie Craig's that he had done, uh, talking about dealing with the coralline algae. So we were aware this was going to be a next step. We'd been trying to figure out what to do. So the first thing we noticed was actually some, uh, filamentous algae just kind of starting on the frag plugs. So the first thing that we did was we collected them onto this rack. It was probably about this size and we stuck 
probably there would have been about 30 different fry plugs on it and we would take that, move it over into our invertebrate system. Uh, we happen to have a very nice large invertebrate system where we have tanks full of Astria, Mexican red legs, blue leg hermits, emerald crabs, a big assortment. Uh, so we put them in with Astria snails first, knowing from what Jamie had learned that you needed something not aggressive, something that couldn't potentially rip the coral uh, where it was starting to grow more of its structure. So we tried the Astra snails. They worked very well at cleaning off the non-aggressive algaes at the beginning that were starting to form. And we did that for, I think, about three weeks. And then we noticed that we started to get coralline algae growing. Obviously, Astra snails cannot remove coralline algae. So that's where we took the information that Jamie had uh, found with the diadema or long spine urchins. So luckily enough, we had found that we'd had a spawning event a few months before, so we actually had a wide variety of sizes of diadema urchins. So the nice thing is we had the big large ones, which obviously, again, we don't want to put onto the coral babies because they have not created their night, their strong skeleton yet. They're still susceptible to uh, being eaten by something a bit stronger um, or more aggressive. So what we were able to do was use very small baby diadema urchins. And I was able to replicate a similar experiment with the Astra snail. So I could take these little racks, move them into one of the tanks in our invertebrate system and place a diadema urchin on every single piece. So this ended up being basically- On every single one. Yeah. You place on every one single on one. <laughs> yes, on every did single you do one. It every day. You did this every day. I did this once a week. It ended up being Mondays oh, with my week. cleaning okay. Monday. Uh, but it definitely took a full, I'd say, 10 hour day of rotating the racks through because we ended up having 250 um, Pasilopora babies and 12 uh, torch babies that we had to rotate through this. So we left them for a couple hours because it wasn't quite long enough for the urchins to do any damage, uh, but it was enough to remove the coralline. So how long and i mean in, in the whole time obviously they're they're growing and they're expanding at, at what point do they reach what point did you find where they reached kind of a size where they're able to stand on their own uh without this level of, of <laughs> tension that took about five to six months it was quite intense for the first five to six months um in month five uh, we actually ended up losing a few because we reduced our protocols thinking they didn't quite need as much attention. Uh, by that point, we were doing the urchins once a month and we were using Mexican red legs actually to remove the filamentous algae uh, because they're a less aggressive hermit crab. They're one of my favorite ones to use in your tank uh, because they still scavenge, but uh, they won't attack anything, uh, which again with baby's corals meant that they weren't quite as aggressive for picking and pulling things off of them. They're a bit more gentle. So in month five, we left things for maybe, we were go tried to go about two weeks, uh, but that's when we noticed we had um, some of the filamentous Mentis algae is caught and then burned the corals. So we had to do a little bit of trimming of the corals to help them uh, be able to recover from that. So other than, I mean, so obviously that's a huge part of it. I mean, that's probably where one of the biggest commitments comes from. Uh, I know yes. this from talking to Jamie as well, that, that obviously after you have the, the spawning um, and you have the settlement, which is when you discovered that you'd had this happen in your tank, yeah. Uh, is is raising is assisting these these young corals as they start out life and they start to expand. Um, other than doing all of this maintenance in terms of preventing them from being overrun by algae, is there anything else that you needed to do as well? And what kind of conditions do they like in terms of high flow, same sort of lighting, everything uh, relative to the commercial systems that you already have set up and running? So this is where for me it became really interesting. I love a challenge and because we've been reefing now for somewhere around 16 to 17 years, uh, this was interesting because it was completely new. So we're used to um, maintaining great parameters, being able to keep the SPS, low nutrient systems, but what the baby corals required was a higher level of food and nutrient in the system and they also required the parameters to remain even more stable than we had them so whereas we found the larger corals um, 
or even when you frag a torch coral or uh, an SPS coral and you put it down, usually there's a couple weeks where you need to be a little bit more aware, again, of, like you said, about the lighting, things like that. We didn't find the lighting uh, was a big problem with our baby corals. They seemed to adapt very quickly to the lighting that was already set up in the tank. But we did find that if we became a little bit lax in terms of making sure we were doing our regular feeding of um, oyster feast to the tank, and um, phytoplankton, we did find that they started to almost show a, um, we noticed that they were able to react within about a week to not having enough food. So they would start paling up in color or same idea if we were overfeeding just a little bit too much, they definitely browned out much more quickly than we would notice with uh, the typical corals that we've been raising for this long. Uh, the other thing that we noticed was alkalinity swings and magnesium swings affected the coral, the baby corals much more quickly than the other corals. So it was quite interesting because we used them kind of like a barometer in the system. So if they started to um, have their polyps pulled in, if they weren't reacting appropriately, then we knew something was off and it meant that we tested everything in our systems or even sent in for an ICP test. We found that when in the spring, there's a flush out that we have up here in Toronto, I'm not sure about in other places, where we find that the water quality coming through, we actually have to change out our our ODI systems more frequently than we would normally. So if normally we're able to run them for, um, let's say four weeks, we were only able to run them for about two weeks. It was the same idea. We would come in and we'd notice that the tips of the Pacillopora babies were actually burnt back. And one of the first things that we started doing was checking our TDS coming out of the, out of the, uh, out of the tap. Got you. So, um, you know, summing it up after you get settlement, then, you need to make sure that they're not overrun by algae as they settle and you have them on, yeah. you have relocated them onto plates. And then after that, uh, you need, like with most growing children, to feed them the correct quantity of meat and vegetables in the form of uh, <laughs> phyto and oyster eggs, but yeah. not too much to the point where you might impact your water quality. They generally are more susceptible to changes in water quality in every form, both, uh, it sounds like, negative things like nitrates, phosphates, as well as swings in alkalinity and whatnot. But beyond that, like lighting, everything else is consistent. So um, yeah. last question here is how big are they now? And because I know you're, you're planning on actually incorporating them into your grow out in your uh, aquaculture. Systems. Yeah, so yeah, so we're about uh, two and a half years later, and what we have known, what we've had for survivability is out of the Pacillopora babies, we had, I believe it's, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but I believe it was around 180 survive out of the 250, and those Pacillopora babies. 180 out of 250 survived. Wow, yes. that's excellent. Yeah, we're very, we're very, very happy with that. Um, especially, like I said, considering we had a lot of swings, we had some uh, learning curves, like you always have, I think, in any reef system uh, when you're taking on a new project. Uh, but now the neat thing is they're all ranging between two to three inches are our smallest pieces, up to five to six inches for some of the Pacillopora babies that didn't experience any... Um, any burns from water quality or filamentous algaes, they're, they're hitting about five to six inches across. And the torches are actually exact same sizing, which is really interesting to me. Uh, so cl when they're closed, the skeletons closed on the torches, we have three that are between uh, five to six inches of skeletal structure on the torches as well. Wow, so in two and a half years, <laughs> settlement all the way up to five to six inches, that's incredible. Yeah. Well, very cool. Thank you for that update. I'm sure I'll have lots more questions in the future, but I think uh, for today, that's really interesting. So thank you for sharing that with us. And then I think that's also just great information from a more kind of practical standpoint about how you can raise settlement if you have a coral spawning event in your tank and how to raise it through to five to six inch 
I wouldn't say that's quite colony size yet, but it's it's getting there rapidly. Yeah, it's definitely it, they're definitely at the size that we would consider them uh, something that we would move into our propagation system, like you said. So five to six is good enough that we can let them start watching them, grow them out, take little frags to start separating them out into um, some more pieces for further culturing. And uh, this this was definitely something that seemed surprising to me because. I didn't think they would be this fragile, in all, all honesty. So when you look at the fact that, you know, Patrick's a stickhead guy, so we've been able to keep Acropora that have multiple colors. We've learned how to run a low nutrient system. We've ran ultra low nutrient systems in the past. You know, I kind of thought this would be a piece of cake, but it definitely, it shows that there's always something new to learn. Okay, well, thank you so much, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon, Trina. Okay, perfect. I'll talk to you soon, Jay. Bye. Bye.